morning. The uh, scripture reading this morning is taken from the second book of Corinthians, chapter 5, starting at verse 14. For let Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Just wanted to start with a show of hands this morning. Uh, raise your hand if you know what it's, look, uh, what it's like to be on call for work. Have, has anybody here ever been on call before? Um, not too many, actually. I thought there'd be more. But even, even if you haven't done this before, you know, you kind of understand what the situation's like, right? You, uh, you're sort of working, you know, because it's always in the back of your mind that the phone could ring at any point and, and you'd have to start working. So it's sort of, it's there in your mind. But, but you're also not really working, you know, because you can still do most anything you want. You just have to be reachable. You have to be close to wherever it is that you're working. You know, when you're on shift, though, that's different, right? You have to be somewhere. You have an actual job to do, and you have to do it. Being on call and on shift, those are, those are sort of related things, but, but really they're completely different. Uh, this morning, I, I want to look at how that relates to the Christian walk. I think there are two ways that we can look at what it means to follow Christ or to be a Christian. We can look at it, uh, at, our, at our walk with Christ, for the most part, as sort of like being on call. You know, we have a connection to Jesus, but for the most part, there's nothing really active going on. You know, maybe we check in with Him once a week when we come to church, kind of like you might check your phone uh, once in a while with your employer to see if there's anything to do. But for the most part, we're just sort of waiting around and waiting to see if anything specific will come up for us to do. But for the most part, we just kind of go back to doing whatever it is that we feel like doing until we get the call. I mean, we're on call after all, not on shift. <laughs> but the other way to look at it is that we are called. We don't need a special sign from heaven telling us what to do. We aren't waiting around for a specific task. We can look at the scriptures and see that Jesus has already called us. And so we're on shift, so to speak. And I want to submit to you this morning that the second viewpoint tracks much more closely with what the Bible has to say about our walk with Christ. You ain't on call, you are called. <laughs> And that's the title of the lesson this morning. Verse 18 of our reading says it like this. Uh, all of this, speaking about our calling, is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. The ministry of reconciliation. The scripture that is on the screen here, it applies to every Christian. Brothers and sisters, we ain't on call. We are called. We are called to take up uh, the ministry that Paul calls the ministry of reconciliation. We've already uh, been called, you know, and this is a huge part of our purpose, which is what we're talking about in December, right? Our purpose, what we believe about that. And so this morning, I want to get into this. I want to spend some time uh, filling out 
our understanding of what God has actually called us to, what our calling is, and then we can go into exactly how we respond to that call. So let's start by looking at the what question. You know, what is our calling exactly? Have you ever prayed to God um, <laughs> to, to figure out what your purpose is, to ask Him what you're supposed to be doing with your life? Anybody ever prayed that prayer? I've prayed that prayer so many times. And in some ways, you know, that's a good prayer. It shows that you want to do God's will. But there's also a sense in which we don't really need to pray that prayer because God's will for your life and God's will for mine is not really a mystery. You know, we need to pray for guidance with some of the specifics, but in a general sense, His will for us is super clear in the Scriptures. If we, you know... It, it, I know that, uh, I don't know if you've ever really thought about that. You know, we might be praying for something, we might be praying for an answer that he's already given us. We already looked at, at verse 18 from our reading today. Uh, God has called us to a specific ministry, right? The, the ministry of reconciliation. And verse 17, the verse before that, goes as far as saying that this calling is so important that it should be life-changing for us. So life-changing, in fact, that it's like starting a, an entirely new life. We become a new creation. So what does it look like, though, to live this new life? Well, in, in short, it's, it's doing what Jesus did. Verse 18 says that Jesus reconciled us to God through himself. And then Jesus used his life to reconcile, you know, he used his life to reconcile that broken relationship between us and between God through himself. And this is exactly what Jesus wants you to do as well for other people. He has called us to follow in his footsteps, to imitate his example. He wants you to use your life uh, for this mission in this specific way. Have you ever considered that though? Have you considered that this calling applies directly to your life and mine? Now, does that mean that we have to leave uh, everything behind, you know, leave our country, leave our home, and go to a, some faraway mission field to accomplish this calling? Does it mean that you need to quit your job and take up a paid ministry position? No. <laughs> I mean, not for most of us anyways. We don't need to find a new country or a new job to answer the call. We just need to be willing to pick up the phone right where we're at. You know, we don't need to move away to find a new country or a new job to answer the call. We just have to pick up the phone right where we're at today. And in fact, it's probably going to be more effective if we simply look at everything you're already doing with a different purpose in mind. It's very possible that God has placed you right where you're at right now for a reason. That's your mission field. You are a missionary wherever you are. You ain't on call. You are called. We see this idea all over the scriptures. Uh, check out what Jesus says in Matthew 4.19. He said, come and follow me and I will send you out to be fishers of people or to fish for people. These uh, were Jesus' words to some of his first disciples. Remember, uh, we talked about how Jesus used his life to reconcile us to God, right? We see here that he had the same plan for his followers. He was going to train them up and then send them out to do the same thing that he was doing. Jesus also said it a different way in John 20, 21. Uh, he said, again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Jesus was sent to restore broken relationships between God and the people that he made. And he, Jesus, is calling his followers, is calling his followers to do the same thing. This is our purpose. You know, this is our calling. We've been called to do the same thing. And finally, we know this passage. We, we talk about this one a lot. The Great Commission, we see the same thing here. Jesus said to his followers, Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Jesus sent us out to continue what he started. Our calling is to carry on his work, and we do this by helping other people live for Christ. This is what it means to make disciples, and this is our calling 
to follow Jesus' plan for our life and to help the people around us do the same thing. When we do this, we continue to work at reconciling the broken relationships between a holy God and the people he has made. And we help to undo the damage of sin in this world. Our purpose is clear. We are called to be Jesus' representatives in this world. But I think sometimes we really struggle to see that calling in a personal way, right? Maybe we think that, you know, being on the mission for Christ is just is for some like elite Christians or something. Or, or just people who take their faith like really seriously. Or maybe people who are in like a paid position in a church. But the truth is that it applies to every one of us. It's like that analogy Jesus used of the yeast in the dough. You know, if everyone sees us, uh, if every one of us sees this as our purpose, we spread through the culture that we are in and we take Jesus' message with us wherever we go in our homes, our workplaces, our schools, the community. It spreads like yeast through the dough. Everywhere we go is a mission field. Going on a mission trip or being in full-time ministry isn't something that's reserved for people who are on a different level of Christianity. There are no levels. Jesus has called all of us to be full-time missionaries, full-time ministers. This is our purpose. No matter where we live, where we work, where we play, it's all a mission field. You ain't on call. You are called right where you are. So if we accept the fact that we are called, the next logical question is, well, how, you know, how do we live it out? How do you answer the call? And I, I think this is, this is part of, uh, the, part of the answer is this is where our prayer life comes in. It's not whether or not we're called, you know, we certainly are, but maybe our prayers can shift from being something like, God, please show me what my calling is. You know, maybe it can shift from that to being something more like, God, how can I best live out my calling where I'm at right now? Maybe it's in our decision making too. Maybe instead of making decisions based on the financial implications or the career implications, I'll also start considering how my decisions will make, make or break my ability to uh, live out my calling. Besides this, though, there are a few other things that our passage this morning can really help us to understand about the calling that we have. The first thing is, uh, is that we need a new motivation. And secondly, we need new eyes. And finally, we need a new direction. And I want to go through these three things here, connecting them to our passage, so that we can really see and understand how this new calling applies to our life. Verse 14 begins by talking about the motivation part. The language here is awesome. Paul says that Christ's love compels him. And I don't want to gloss over that. That's, that's important to catch. The Greek word for uh, compel has this idea of being taken a hold of by something, gripped by it, you know, being seized by something. Paul is saying that Christ's love has seized his attention. It's gotten a hold of him. And it's taken over his life. Verse 15 says that the reason that Jesus died was to show us this new way of life. Instead of living for self, Jesus actually showed us in the flesh how to live for God. The ultimate example of this was him literally dying for us. But we don't need to literally die for people to follow his example. I hope you know that. We can follow his example whenever we live sacrificially for the people around us and for God. It's the difference between waking up in the morning and thinking, how can I serve myself today? And instead, waking up and thinking, how can I live to serve my God today? How can I answer his call with the people that he has literally put right in front of me today? How can I do it with the people that are on my path? This change in thinking, I think, describes uh, what Jesus came to show us how to do. And Paul said that what motivated him most to live this way was thinking about Christ's love for him. And this can be a motivation for us as well. It must be. If you're anything like me, though, <laughs> this doesn't happen automatically. There's always something that seems to be more pressing or more urgent than thinking about Jesus' love for you, right? It's easier to think about, you know, how Jesus died for other people 
but not really take it personally and believe, you know, deep down that he died for me too. And I think this is where we need to camp out if, if we're finding this, this difficult to answer the call. It could be that you haven't really gotten your head and your heart around the fact that God loves you, that Christ loves you, and that he died for you. If that's you, there's a pretty good chance that this sermon is not what's going to help the most. You, you need to get with other Christians and talk through those things. I've gone through this myself in some ways, like I mentioned, I still struggle with it. In a world that's, man, in our world that is just so intensely focused on the success of the individual, it's hard to get your heart around the fact that it's not all about you. You know, we naturally relate everything to our performance, to our achievements, to our track record, and unfortunately, sometimes Christ's love falls into that category. We want to feel like we've earned it. We've earned his love, you know. And it's hard to take our performance out of that equation. That's not an easy shift to make in your head and your heart, but you have to make it because it's going to motivate you. You need to be freed up from that self-centered way of, of thinking and living, and you need to make Jesus the center of your life, not you. So we need a new motivation. Uh, and that motivation is Christ's love, but we also need new eyes. Because we need to see the people around us differently. We need to see them the way that God does. And this is why our motivation needs to change first. If we have a self-centered focus, we're, going, we're not going to be able to see people the way that God does. It, it says here that we're going to see them in a worldly point of view. A world, you're going to see other people from a worldly point of view. Meaning that their worth, the people's worth in your eyes... Uh, will depend on whether or not they bring any value to your life. But if we have God's eyes, we're going to see them very differently. Having a worldly point of view of other people is kind of like wearing fatal vision goggles. Have you ever heard of these things? Fatal vision goggles? When I was in high school, I was taking a course to get my driver's license. I don't know if they still do this. But MPI was doing this program where they came into school and they got all the students to wear these things. There, there's a picture of them. They're called fatal vision goggles. And, and when you wear them, it kind of replicates the visual and the perception issues that happen when you're really drunk. And so, you know, they put these goggles on all of us and they got us to do some tests, right? You had to walk a straight line. You had to try to put something together with your hands and, and use your hand-eye coordination. And I remember it being really, like, really hard, like impossible. Uh, things seemed to look a certain way. Like, through the goggles, it looked a certain way. But it was not reality. Like, the reality was totally different because my vision was so distorted. And I want to suggest something similar happens when we see ourselves as the center of our lives. If our attitude in everything we do is like, how will this benefit me? It's like wearing the drunk goggles. We're going to see everything around us in a distorted way. How can this person serve my purposes is what's going to be going on in our mind. And if that person can't benefit us, then we won't see their value. Verse 16, uh, Paul taught, in verse 16, Paul mentions something like this. He, he says that knowing his purpose causes him to look at people differently. He doesn't see them in a worldly way anymore. Now he sees them for who they truly are. He sees them like God sees them. And this is a big deal for us. We have to see people in this way too. When we see people the way that God sees them, it's going to change how we interact with them. That person in the lineup in front of you at the grocery store is no longer just somebody standing between you and the exit. <laughs> you know, you know your purpose now, and you see them as a child of God. Your spouse is no longer someone who just lives with you in your house. You, your eyes are open, you could say. The goggles are off, and now you see them as a son or a daughter of God. That person who annoys you at school or, or at work or wherever is no longer just an inconvenience to you. You begin to see them as someone who's lost and need God's help. It's like taking off the drunk goggles and seeing a whole new reality that was already there, but you never really saw it because you were living for the wrong purpose or, or you just didn't understand your purpose. When we know why we're here, 
it changes how we see people. Think of how it would change your day-to-day life if when you looked at someone, your first thought was, how can I help that person grow closer to Jesus? Instead of thinking, how will that person benefit me? We're thinking, I wonder what Jesus could do with their life if they were closer to him. I have to believe that if we approached our life with with these new eyes, many of our daily distractions uh, would be removed. Many of our interactions throughout the day would change. We need to follow Jesus' lead in dying to self so that we can live for him and for this purpose that he has given us. We need new eyes. And so the last thing I want to highlight is our need for a new direction. Have you ever gone away on a trip? Uh, Maybe you left the country or left the city or something, and and you left something in the care of someone else. Maybe you had someone come and house sit for you to take care of your house. Or maybe someone came over to your house and uh, you entrusted your family pet into their care. Or maybe it was your kids. You had a weekend away, maybe with your spouse, and you entrusted someone else with the care of your children. I think we get this, right? We get the significance of that. We don't just choose just anybody for a task like this. It it has to be someone that we trust will get the job done safely. (laughs) Did you know that God has entrusted us with something? He's entrusted us with what we've been talking about today, this calling, this purpose. Verse 18 and 19 uh, say that God has entrusted us with the ministry of reconciliation, like we talked about, and he's, he's entrusted us with this message of reconciliation that we have. Like I've been saying, you ain't on call. You are called. And God has called you and I to something. It's not just a work for the serious Christians or the super devoted followers of Christ or the paid staff of a local congregation. That would be such a shame because we would have so few people answering the call. God has entrusted you with this work. And I I hope you hear that as an exciting thing. In your job, in your home, with the people on your street, your friends, your family. He's entrusted you with this message for them. He has entrusted you with this valuable work and that should mean something to you. It means he believes in you. He, he believes that he can work through you and get it done. Even though maybe you don't feel like you have what it takes. I, I get that feeling. You can actually answer the call. And I, I hope that inspires you with some confidence. With Christ leading, with his spirit empowering. God really believes that you can do this. It seems like a lot. But, but one thing that can give us some confidence is knowing that we're not alone. Right? As God said, uh, sorry, as I said, God empowers us through his Holy Spirit. And that's no small thing. We're not alone in this work. God's Spirit is dwelling right within you. And he's with you, carrying out this work. Jesus said the same thing in the Great Commission. We, We just read it. He said that as we carry out the Great Commission, that he is always with us. And I think that's important to know. And it's also important, I think, to build on this idea. Because if he's with us, we need to know where to look in order to find him. Back in my uh, engineering days, one of the most important things for me to do was to speak with the customers. I was actually in charge of designing new products that we were going to sell. And if, if I wanted to design something that people would actually pay for... I had to go to the people and find out what they liked about what we were already doing and what they didn't like. And the tricky thing about this is that I was designing products for farmers, and farmers are really focused people. It's hard to get their attention. And since they offer the best feedback when they're actually using the equipment, it made the most sense for me to go to them. Right? In, a, in, a, in a farming world, when it's time to harvest, it's time to harvest, and pretty much everything else goes on hold. It's not like I could just call a, a person up, a farmer, and meet him at a coffee shop to talk about how the harvest is going. I mean, he's out there harvesting, and he ain't leaving to talk to me. So if I want to be with him, I have, 
and have any kind of meaningful conversation, then the only way for me to do it is to fly to the closest city, get in a car, drive to his field, climb up into the cab, and work alongside him. That's where you're going to get his attention. That's where you're going to get his presence. And now I, I realize this analogy isn't perfect. It, it's not that Jesus is too busy or to care about you, and I, and I hope you don't hear that. But I think there is something about this situation that applies to our relationship with Christ. It's harvest time for him. Jesus said that the fields are ripe for harvest and he's busy working through the people in this world who have joined him to bring in the harvest for his father. And if we want to experience his presence, if we want to know what he's about, if we want to get that feeling that our life is in sync with him, the best way to experience all of that, I submit to you, is to, is to go to him. To go to him. And I don't mean physically move. I mean spiritually move. Answer the call. <laughs> right where you're at. Remember, you ain't on call. You are called. He has already called you to join him in the harvest. And his harvest field is right before your eyes. In your home in your workplace, in this congregation, if you want to experience His presence, I think the best way to do that is to go to work with Him. In John 12, um, there's a pretty cool story that we often overlook. I recommend reading this if you have time later. Uh, from verse 9 to 26. We don't have time to go through all of it today. Uh, but I'll try to hit the highlights this morning. The story picks up right after Jesus has raised uh, his friend Lazarus from the dead. Obviously, that got some attention. <laughs> and there was this huge crowd of people following him around. And this is about the time near the end of Jesus' life on earth when he was riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. You remember this, right? Um, this, this was about the time, it's about a week before he died. Um, a week before his crucifixion. And, and so this crowd that was following him around after he raised Lazarus was, was there with him when he was riding in on the donkey. And uh, in John 12, 18, it says this, the reason why the crowd went to meet him as he was riding in was that they heard that he had done this sign, raising Lazarus from the dead. So the crowd was there to see Jesus because you know, they heard about him raising Lazarus, and maybe they thought, well, maybe he'll do some other cool thing, and we'll see it. And then in verse 21, out of the crowd, there's these two Greek guys that come up to Philip, one of his disciples, one of his followers, and they say to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. What do you think Jesus would say to this request? Well, we, we don't have to wonder because his answer is right there in the text. And, and in his typical fashion, <laughs> Jesus doesn't directly answer the question. Uh, but he gives an answer to an even greater question that they didn't even know they should be asking. And here's what he said in John 12, 25, and 26. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. Anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant will also be. My father will honor the one who serves me. So here's his answer. The crowds were following him around, trying to catch a glimpse of another miracle. These two guys come up, wanting to meet Jesus. They wanted to be with him. And Jesus says, in essence, if you really want to experience what it's like to be with me, you need to follow me. <laughs> if you want to be where I am, you need to follow my example. If you're trying to hold on to your life, if you're trying to keep yourself at the center of your life, if you're trying to love your life, you're not going to find me there. You're going to find me when you learn to turn away from a self-centered way of living and start living your life for my mission. And I think these words are so powerful. They're so relevant for us today. If we're looking to find Jesus in our comfort zone, we might be looking in the wrong place. If we're trying to find Christ in a self-centered life, we might not see him there. If we're following him around like this crowd was, just to see what he can do for us, we might find that we don't really experience a whole lot of what he has to offer. We need a new direction. 
in that direction is following in his footsteps, answering his call, taking up his mission. So I hope that what we've been talking about this morning is giving you something to reflect on. Maybe you need to take some time to pray to God about some of these things, about about what motivates you in your life, about how you see other people, the people in front of you, about the direction that your life is heading in. Maybe this is something you need to bring up with your brothers and sisters this week in a small group. Have you been living your life on call for Christ? Have you been sitting around, killing time, and waiting for him to reach out, tap you on the shoulder, and tell you what to do? I hope this message is clear this morning. You ain't on call. You are called. We all are. If there's anything that you need help with in responding to this message, as always, I encourage you uh, to speak with another Christian that you know and trust. And as always, if, if you don't have anyone else to talk to, I am here for you. I am here to talk about this, and if if you want to grow in this area, I would be happy to speak with you about that. Brothers and sisters, you are called. Let's go out this week and answer the call together. Thank you for your time.